Well, it's, it's, it's hard not to agree with Niall Ferguson when you look at 9 million dead and 22 million wounded and empires destroyed, uh, uh, the ushering in of communism, the, the um, United States uh, rising to the top, um, uh, you know, that this is the nature of the First World War. It's a massively a catastrophic event. Well, the problem with Niall Ferguson though is that he's saying that with a massive dose of hindsight. <laughs> he is saying that having knowing the end result and I think the question that has to be asked is what did people at the time think? That's what historians ask. Historians try to understand the context of the time. They try to um, understand the decisions made or not made and the reasons why. And I think that's where Ferguson's argument is doesn't stand up as well. Um, in so far as that, um, we have been reading uh, hundreds of books over the last hundred years that have looked at the start of the war and all the reasons for that, the complicated treaty system, the alliances, the, um, the arms race that went on, the Balkan wars before this, the, the powder keg that was set off by the assassination of the Archduke. It's all there and decisions were made that pushed these countries towards war. Um, and so, in the end, it, I, I think it's not a question, uh, it's fun, it's a fun game to play, is it a necessary war or an unnecessary war? Without a doubt, it was not a necessary war. Uh, I don't think anybody felt that they had to go to war to achieve some sort of greater aim. What happened, though, was that Europe did go to war, and there were reasons why they went to war. And so that should tell us something, I think, about how difficult it can be in times of war to put the brakes on once you've already committed yourself to war. I mean, one of the, one of the few truisms about war is that the war you think you're going to get is almost never the war that you get. Everybody thinks it's going to be a short war. Everyone thinks they have a chance of winning the war or that they will win the war. Um, otherwise, I mean, uh, there are very few nations that go to war expecting to lose at the, uh, at the onset. There are some that feel so backed into a corner that there's no other way out. But most nations thought that they could win this war in some way. And so one of the questions then is, what were the war aims of the various nations going to war? What did they think they were going to get out of it? If they expected the casualties to be heavy, which they did, I mean, there is a there's a fallacy that of the short war idea. Um, recent research over the last 10 years has made it pretty clear that most of the generals were saying, in fact, that this, would, this will probably be a long drawn out war. So what did we think was actually going to happen here? Um, that's a question that, that we should be looking at, I think. What did, what did Germany think it was getting out of backing Austria? We know what the Austrians wanted. They wanted to smash Serbia. They wanted to punish Serbia. They had a very definite goal there. Why did the Italians come in on the side of the Entente powers? They were really allied. They were really supposed to be fighting with the Germans at some point. Well, they had their own goals, uh, which was a land grab from Austria-Hungary. What did the Russians think they were going to get out of this? Theirs might have been more emotional, that they were protecting their small their Slavic brother, the Serbians. But they too had goals. The French had goals. They wanted to reclaim Alsace and Lorraine from the Franco-Prussian War. What did Britain think it was doing? Now that's a little more complicated. They went to war, Britain that is, uh, ostensibly because Belgium had been invaded by the Germans and so that this was seen as a just war. But of course they had more al um, altruistic reasons which was they wanted a balance of power in Europe. To keep the British Empire functioning, you had to have a stable Europe without Germany or, for that matter, France dominating it. And if Germany had won that war, they would have dominated Europe and that would have changed everything. So everyone has a reason for going to war and I think that's worth keeping in mind. Uh, and it's worth remembering, of course, on the 4th of August 1914, Canada finds itself at war. We don't have say over that. We are automatically at war as a British dominion within the British Empire. What we did control is what, the, what you're getting at in your question is how many Canadians would serve in this war? Would it be like the South African War? Only 15 years earlier, uh, where only about 8,000 Canadians served. It was very much an English-Canadian war. Well, no, things have changed 15 years later. Um, the country has matured over that time. It's larger, it's still agricultural, but we are deeply committed to standing by Britain uh, in this war. And now this is a major European war. This is a war 
um, which many Canadians believe um, is a just war insofar as that uh, militaristic Germany has invaded uh, Belgium. They have to be driven out. But in the end, uh, we go to war and we stand by Britain throughout this war because Britain's there. And I think if you ask the question of how do we go from a few thousand men or 30,000 in the first contingent that go over in October of 1914 to over 620,000, which is the final total, that's an incredible exertion from Canada. And if you add on top of that, what we are doing on our farms, and we often forget we're an agricultural nation, but our wheat and our grain and our food supplies, we are feeding the world. This is a major contribution from Canada. As, <coughs> excuse me, as well, we go from uh, almost no munitions industry to a thriving industry by 1917 where one-fourth of all British shells fired on the Western Front are made in Canada. So if you had just taken those two contributions, food and munitions, Canada would have been deeply linked and, and um, a part of this war. But that wasn't enough. It had to be men. And the men kept enlisting. And they enlisted by the tens of thousands and then the hundreds of thousands. And 1915 and 16, uh, by the end of 16, some 300,000 Canadians in uniform. That's an incredible number, especially when we consider a nation of yet 8 million, as you said, um, and that th these are not professional soldiers. These are farmers and clerks, and they're bankers and students, and they come from all classes and all regions, and that's important. That makes it a total war. That means it's not a war just fought by professional soldiers, but it's a war fought by your neighbor or your son or someone in your church or in your community. Now, how they got those hundreds of thousands is through recruiting, of course, through propaganda, through pressure, um, young men who felt the need to go overseas and fight. Um, there are countless reasons why an individual Canadian may have gone, but in the end it is, it is an incredible figure. We like to think that they were naive. We like to think that, that we're smarter today. We like to think that they went for a sense of adventure. And certainly the first group that went, before the massive killing battles of 1914, that may stand up as true. Well, in fact, most of those soldiers went because they were British-born and they, they felt close ties to Britain. But for soldiers who enlisted after mid-1915, everybody knew what was happening overseas. The casualties, even to Canadians, our second battle of Ypres in April 1915, the first use of lethal chlorine gas, the Canadians in a massive fighting retreat, uh, we lose 6,000 men in four days. I mean, imagine today losing 6,000 soldiers in four days of fighting. Um, there was no way to cover that up. There's no way to spin that. It was seen as a gallant stand, as it was. But those casualty lists are being published in every newspaper. And so that argument that people didn't know what they were getting into doesn't make any sense if you actually think about it. And then if you actually read the letters and diaries of soldiers, um, they, they have their own reasons for going. Um, they believe that this is a just war. They believe it's a war fought for liberal values, which in effect would be what we would call today a war for democracy. Um, now, some of them went because they were young and, and stupid and they didn't understand. And some wanted a sense of adventure and some look, wanted to look good in a uniform for a girl. All the reasons why young men go to war. But um, you can't reduce it to the simple fact that people didn't know what was happening. It's pretty clear now, and historians have established for many years, that Canadians on the home front understood what was happening overseas. Now that may be different than, you know, actually knowing what it's like to be in a frontline trench, crawling with lice, with snipers who will take your head off, with rats living off the corpses of the previously fallen. That's a different thing. Nonetheless, and, and of course it was a shock for those soldiers who arrived to the Western Front to see that, but nonetheless I think we have to broaden our understanding and try to understand what motivated these young Canadians a hundred years ago.